there is a doctor in the house. As a matter of fact, a doctor who delivered 4,000 babies. That's a lot of babies to bring into this world. Has he and his wife Carol have five children, like Deanna and I. They have 18 grandchildren. They have a good lead on that. Uh, went to, graduated from Duke University School of Medicine. Went to the same school as one of our kids. So that's a pretty, pretty good way to identify with a great national leader. And frankly, Congressman Paul, the, the great thing about Congressman Paul is that he has been delivering this message for a long time. And frankly, there's a lot of folks in Washington who weren't listening, but they're listening now. And I remember Congressman Paul's messages of 10 years ago when so many in Washington's establishment would not pay too much attention to how much attention they're paying to his message today. And there's, I've always had a warm spot for all the right reasons for a man who, in spite of the numbers, stands up for what he believes in and fights for what he believes in. And this gentleman has never stopped fighting for his beliefs and, frankly, their beliefs that more and more Americans share today. And so I want you to join me in giving a warm welcome to Congressman Ron Paul. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. A lot of enthusiasm. We have a lot of major problems. We have a lot of major problems in this country, but you know what? There's a revolution going on in this country today. It's a very healthy revolution. It's been going on, especially for the last four or five years, and it, it has, has been designed to deal with the problems that we have because we have drifted far too far, far too away from our Constitution, our individual liberties, a sensible foreign policy, and the American people are not only tired of it, they're sick of paying for it because we're out of money and we have to do something about it. But I see the, uh, the crisis that we're in basic as an attack on liberty. Personal liberty solves a lot of problems. That's what our country is all about. The founders understood this. They detested the king. The king was abusive with the military, detested the taxes, detested the abuse of civil liberties. So they knew and understand exactly what liberty meant. That meant that people had a right to their life, they had a right to their liberty, and it didn't come from the government, it came from our Creator. And they also believed that you had the right to keep the fruits of your labor. They did not give us an income tax, and that is, uh, was a precise reason we got that income tax later on. The 20th century has, had not been, was not kind to us, was not kind to our, uh, our, 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 our financial situation, our debt, our foreign policy, our monetary policy. You know, 1913 was a bad year. It was sort of unlucky. It was 1913 we got, you know, the income tax, which was just encouraging the spending. But we also got another bureau that became very detrimental, and some days we're going to get rid of it, and that is the Federal Reserve System of 1913. Now, the reason... The reason the Federal Reserve is so important, one of the major reasons I got involved in politics many years back was in 1971, we severed all linkage of our money uh, to gold, which meant that the founders' ideas were rejected. The founders understood something about the runaway from inflation of the continental dollar. So they put in the Constitution, you can't use anything except gold and silver as legal tender and you can't print money. Matter of fact, in 1792, when they, first, when they wrote the first coinage act, they said that anybody who committed uh, could counterfeit, that they would get the death penalty. That's how serious they thought it was. But there's been a lot of counterfeiting going on lately, so I don't know whether we're <laughs> getting around to invoking the death penalty. But the one thing is, we, we have a terrible situation now. If you as an individual American believe that uh, the old silver coins and gold coins and the Constitution is right and you use that money, you can be arrested. You can be arrested and your money confiscated and they can say you're a terrorist and that uh, you're counterfeiting by using authentic money. But 
what do we do with the, uh, the real counterfeiters? We leave them alone. Why is that so important? Well, if you're against big government, you have to understand the monetary issue. Because big government grows for a couple reasons. There's a group up in Washington that loves to spend endless money on militarism. That we have to be in every country in the world. We are now in 135 countries. We have 900 bases overseas. It's not defending our country. It's weakening our country. We have less security for it. We need to bring a bunch of those troops home. But we also spend endlessly for the entitlement system. The entitlement system is based on a concept that totally rejects the issue of rights. You have a right to your life and your liberty, and you should have the right to what you earn. But the entitlement system says you don't have a right to keep what you earn. People who want something, uh, from you, they can send a government agent to steal it from you and give it to them, and that's called an entitlement. Believe me, we've had quite a few generations now that believe in this, and when, the, when their goods and services aren't forthcoming, they're going to be very upset, and a bunch of them are getting pretty upset already. But the real reason the entitlement system is so dangerous is the entitlement system is sold on the idea that we're going to help the poor. Sure, help the poor. If you look carefully, you'll find out it helps the rich. And that's what the monetary system does, and that's what the entitlement system does. The best example of this is the housing bubble that we had. The housing bubble on, went on for a good many years. They inflated the currency, printed the money. Everybody loved it. Then they had the Barney Franks of the world come in and say, we have to have this Community Reinvestment Act and force banks to give bad loans. Sure, and that people bought the houses, and the price of the houses went up. They borrow more money against their houses. Permanent prosperity, they claim. But guess what? The bubble that was truly predicted by the Austrian free market economists came, and it burst. It collapsed. So both political leaders, part, both parties went, and they said, we've got to bail them out. It's a disaster, or we'll have a depression. And the truth is, if they hadn't bailed them out, Wall Street would have had a depression, not the people. But we ba <laughs> so we bailed, we bailed out the people who made a lot of money. They were in the financing business. They were in the building business. They were in the mortgage business. They were in the derivatives business. And they talked this country, and unfortunately, they dumped it all on you. So they bailed out the people who ripped us off and dump those securities on us, the Federal Reserve now, with money they create uh, clear air, clean air, uh, clear air they, they hold one trillion dollars of derivatives and worthless assets. That's why your money value goes down. That's why your prices go up. That's why medical care costs too much. That's why education costs too much. So it's this whole concept of money coming to the rescue of the rich and dumping on the poor. Yet how often do we as libertarians and conservatives get blamed and say, oh, you, mind, you mean you don't want the government taking care of everybody? You, you heartless people, you, you have no compassion. But the true compassion comes from liberty. Free markets, sound money. is the answer to our economic woes. The one thing it won't do, it won't create perfect economic quality, and that's what the socialists want. Perfect economic equality, and they're pretty good at achieving it at a very, very low level, and people are equally poor. That's well, not what we want. What we want is opportunity for people to work and keep what they earn. We need the government to be involved. It's not like the government shouldn't exist, but the government shouldn't be the regulator. They shouldn't be the inflator. They shouldn't be the fixer of the interest rates. And they shouldn't be, and they shouldn't be bailing out the, the rich. So, but in, in a free market, there are some very strict regulation, property rights. You can't take another person's property. You can't steal. You can't hurt people. You follow up on your contracts. You can't counterfeit money. And if you mess up, you know what should happen? You should go bankrupt. The other people shouldn't bail you out. And, and, if, and if you do well, you have the right to keep what you earn. In the other area that I believe we have suffered a lot in the last several decades has been the loss of personal liberty. I know there's a lot of different things that happen, but I, I keep thinking that the most symbolic abuse of our personal liberty of being searched without warrants is the abuse that we have all been conditioned to put up with at our airports. <laughs> 
But also it's led to some other silly things. The federal government believes they have to tell you everything to do with your personal life and everything to do with your economic life. You today, and there probably won't be very many in here that might not care personally about this issue, but it's so symbolic. In this day and age that we live in, our government has decided, the federal government has to decide whether or not you're allowed to drink raw milk. Now that's going too far. The solution to so many of our problems we can found in the understanding of personal liberty. Personal liberty is the issue that the founders delivered to us and we have unfortunately rejected it. We have embarked on deficit financing, we embarked on policing the world, we have embarked on running everybody's personal life and uh, we have economic crisis because we're spending money we don't have. We have to think of freedom as being one issue. Freedom, your personal liberty, your religious liberty, your intellectual liberty is exactly the same as your economic liberty, and that is all one package. And people should have a right to do with their life what they want, but they do not have the right to come and get bailouts, either on a personal basis or on a financial basis with the corporations or the big banks. This is what we were given, and unfortunately, unfortunately, we have been so careless and we have allowed this to slip away. So it is true, this is a generation that has to make a decision. And there's a lot of young people right now that are very excited about looking into this in detail. Endorsing the ideas that this Federal Reserve system is a fraud, that we don't need income taxes. We ought to allow young people to opt out of Social Security. So therefore, there's every reason to be optimistic about what is happening if we follow through. The revolution is in ideas, it's a non-violent non revolution. But if we do not achieve what we want to achieve in bringing us back to this understanding of liberty, I believe it could lead to some violence in this country. It's already stirring up in, in the world because when the goods don't come, the people are going to be very upset. So we have to change the attitude. And it's not like I have to invent it or you have to invent it because it was given to us. It was given to us, our liberties were given to us by our, our creator, but it was also delivered to us with the best package ever. We were the freest and the most prosperous country. And what do you have now? An attack on your civil liberties. All you have is debt. And, uh, and we have a perpetual problem with big government. So we do have a tremendous job ahead, but if we look to our traditions and do our hard work, we can restore the greatness of America. That is my goal. Thank you very much.